civilizations survive, providing stunning testimony of a magnificent people. For example, the awesome pyramids of Giza in Cairo could only have been built by a people with absolute mastery of engineering, architecture, physics, mathematics, astrology, and a host of other sciences. Down through time after their construction, scholars and scientists from around the world have come here to study not only the physical structures, but who built them, how they did it, and why. Professor Josef Benyakinen is an Egyptologist, having taught at Cornell University for over 15 years. Dr. Ben, as he is affectionately known, has lectured widely on both sides of the Atlantic. His theme, the ancient civilizations of Egypt. His presentations have placed him in great demand by students and community groups, especially those of African descent. Perhaps the high regard he enjoys today stems from his long, unwavering theme that the ancient civilizations along the Nile were African. In his many appearances, unlike it is, he has said so emphatically, time after time, in the face of most of the curriculums and the Cecil B. DeMille's of our day. This is why Like It Is came to Egypt with Dr. Ben, to have him show us what he's been saying to us for such a long time. Dr. Ben, following him from one side to another, from the Nile's east bank to the west bank. Our journey's first stop was at the wondrous pyramids of Giza. How big is this pyramid that we're on? Which, which this, pyramid are so we this, on now? This is what we are the one of Khufu, which the Greeks called Cheops. This is 48 stories tall. About a story, let's say, it's one, from one floor to the next floor, 10 feet. So you got 48 times 10, 480 foot tall. Now, the metal you see on the top there, showing you where the, the end of the capstone was originally, before it was removed. So it will be fought. But then the building goes down into the ground. What you see there is the earth surface, earth level. But below there you got another two stories down, where you got cutways, walkways, tunnels, and so forth. And recent uh, sounding, they have voids that they believe to be other rooms or whatever, chambers or so forth. Now, downstairs you have beautiful work. The, the freezes and the, uh, so forth that tells various things that the average person will see on the outside. But it's about three and a half city blocks. Three times 200 plus a fraction, 640 feet. Each leg is three and a half city blocks. Roughly square, a square of 640 feet. You got about two million uh, blocks in this building. About two million. How much do, do they estimate each one of these blocks of granite? This is granite? Uh, no. No. This, this is, is limestone. limestone. How did they bring that stone all the way from... And barges. And floating barges. Uh, re quite recently they found the air where they dock, uh, like a wharf, uh, harbor, where they were able to come off the Nile and come up into this area and bring the, the, the stones that were brought. Now you're a civil engineer. How was this thing built? How did they, once they got the blocks here, how did they put them on top of one another? How, how, what's the nature of this awesome building? There are a lot of theories. Mine, if I could add mine, and it may not be mine, some other people may have thought of it, but I take my theory from Karnak Temple, or the Temple of Warit. There is an excess of a ramp left there. And there's some places, you can see some pieces of ramp. So it is obvious that they use the ramp system. The higher they go to keep the same pitch, the longer the ramp came, so they can keep the same degree. It was easy then, because remember, you have about three, 400,000 people not working during the inundation period, the flood period. All of these monuments, wherever you go, are built in highland above the flood level. So when the flood comes, these workers, these farmers have nothing to do. They have this. 
So that, that uh, the, this myth about slave labor? Uh, nonsense. Slave labor is nonsense. Pure, mitigated nonsense. These men were not guessing. They knew definitely what they were about to do. Is it true that each corner of this pyramid represents dead north, south, east, right. and west? It is. It is. It's an on target, as I said. The most modern engineering, geological, uh, geosophical in instruments cannot do this. Dr. Ben, was it always called a pyramid? And no, why? pyramid is a Greek word. Uh huh. Uh, Meaning what? House of fire. House of fire. Yeah, pyramid. Pyra pyra mid mid is house. Like pyromania. Pyromania. Fi house ah. of fire. Why did they call it that? Well. It, I could understand a firehouse. It's just like saying Heliopolis uh, instead of saying on. Uh, the the, uh, the on would be with the sun or the house, uh, the city of the sun. Well, since the sun was symbolically Ra, was symbolically the expression of the deity of the god, then here the pharaoh was building a place where he could come in tune with Ra. That's why the solar book. So you can go on to the sea of Ra, the next world. So what is a pyramid actually? What is the function of the pyramid when it was built? It's the resting place, the final resting place for the body, the cat of the Pharaoh. And it, people, all kinds of people have different theories, but the only one we can get from the ancients who read in the works, it was the final resting place. And when you came here, like everyone who looks upon this, it blows your mind. Then I decided I got to study it. Because I didn't come with intent to study. I came with intent to see, just to see. Well, who did you go to when you were here? You were just here on your own? I was here on my own. Believe it, I had just married. I, I, you know, I, I, the tradition. My father and mother pick up my wife. I, I had to marry by the culture. It was, I'm going to marry the girl, I marry her. She's pregnant, and my father said, look, you got to go, you don't have much time. We are going to take all the expenses for your wife, and we want you to come back before she deliver, so you must go, because it's not going to be much more time. I want you to go before I die. He wasn't going to die. He was a young man. Uh, I mean, the possibility of dying was remote at that time. But he felt that he wanted me to see this, because I had been always complaining of people saying that I came from a place where people eat people, that in Africa this, you know, in Africa that, that the, the whole Nile Valley that I was boasting I was nothing. And so my father said, no, when you come back, you tell me who doesn't have civilization. Is it you or the European? Now there are three here that are right al alongside one another. Father, what? son, and, and, and grandson. I see. The father is one Khufu, the son, the one behind this, Hapra, and the grandson, the last one, Menkara. Well, now, that high point that you were standing at, as you looked at it, which is which? <laughs> this is a little trickier. You can't build a pyramid older, bigger than your father's, or higher. <laughs> so what Kafra did is build a pyramid smaller than his father's, but on higher ground. So, it looks big. <laughs> it looks bigger than his father's pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't violate his father's instruction. But he did his damage. But he anyway. did his damage. <laughs> um, in Cairo, from where? Alexandria. Alexandria. When you went there by boat. I went to Alexandria by boat, and I came down to Cairo by uh, freight train. Now, where did you tell me where you went from there? Well, I went and got housing uh, at the El Nil Hotel. Then from the El Nil, I got a freight train going south, which is in this direction, until I got down here at Luxor. Uh, and not at this point, the railroad station is uh, back away from the Nile a bit, the city of Luxor per se, uh, not here at the waterfront. All right now, before we head on that journey south, you of course went to the pyramids at Giza, in in, in, yeah, I went in Cairo. The, when they at that area, there was only one building, and that was the uh, Mena House, and they considered to be way out in the country, way out. They were the Cement Village and all those places were not there uh, yet. You went uh, to the pyramids at Giza, and 
you were pretty much on your own, but you tried to join a group of students who were there with a professor from England, is that true? Yes. Would a, you repeat that again? There was a professor by the name of Goodenough, and he had, I think it was six or seven uh, students. In those days, there was no school for Egyptology. Uh, you either was in a school for architecture, <coughs> religion, uh, archaeology or so, any of those disciplines and you came and studied with a field man and you learn in the field. Uh, there were very few so-called textbooks in Egyptology. Uh, Egy Egyptology was a thing which you did your apprenticeship with a person in the field. What happened when you ran into this professor? Well, when I went to saw the professor and saw what they were doing, it was right down the alley of what I wanted to do. What were they doing? They were do digging, they were uh, examining and uh, looking at the reliefs in the various building. I asked to join in with them. And I was honestly told that they were sorry that they didn't uh, take people of my color and uh, the exact uh, words. And I said, well, I, it would be nothing wrong I was doing. I was willing to compromise, and I wouldn't get into the way. And uh, he finally said, well, all right, you could stay and go around what we do, but you can't sleep along with us. You would have to sleep away from us. Tell me some of the names that you were referred to as. I was uh, called Snow White. Uh, by this professor? By professor and the other students at the time when they wanted to relate to me. They said Snow White or uh, a Black Boy. Uh, uh, there were so many other names, Black Sambo. And, and they would come out and out and say it whenever they felt like it. Sometimes they would say African, and that's supposed to be an, uh, an insulting word to call me an African. I was supposed to feel bad, but that one I was very happy. When they called me African, I was happy that day. Did you get into the Museum of Cairo at that time? No, because the Museum of Cairo, they wouldn't let me go in there. You didn't get, you didn't, no, you, you didn't go in the Museum of Cairo looking like me. You actually couldn't go in there looking like me. Libraries? Did you go to a university? They were yet? not open to me. So you were really on your own? Yes. Uh, Egypt under the British at that time was no different than Georgia or Mississippi in the United States to a black person. The pyramids in Giza, did you just examine one or did you examine all three and the Sphinx? I really at the time didn't examine per se. Uh, I knew that the tunnel, the, the downstairs or into the pyramid, that there were downstairs walkways and so forth. They weren't open to me at that particular time. Going through the streets of Cairo today, heavily congested, we see all the shops and a lot of people. Was it pretty much like that in those days? No. Uh, Cairo got 16, 15, 14, 15, whatever million people. I think in those days, Cairo may have had close to a million, if that much. It had a, a quite a, it was a quite a healthy sized city. But uh, in 1939, I, I couldn't tell you the amount because I didn't have that leisure to look that close to the part of the population. But I guess it was pretty close to 500,000 or something like that. Mm -hmm. All right, so you boarded this train and you headed south. And your first stop was Luxor, and then you went down to Aswan. Yes, the first stop was Luxor, and it took two, two and a half days to get down to Luxor. And then from there? And from there, uh, I went, uh, I heard there were quite a lot of things to see in the West Bank. I saw uh, the East Bank, uh, and then I could imagine uh, what was on the uh, uh, West Bank. But I didn't have time to go to the West Bank because I wanted to go down as far as I could where the tray went, and that was Aswan. Aswan is located south of Cairo, up the Nile. Remember now, the Nile flows downward to the north. Here, the pace is tranquil and most beautiful. The people here are, as Dr. Ben himself would say, burnt of skin. On the afternoon of our arrival on a sailboat called the Felucca, 
Dr. Ben unfolded the story of the ancient civilizations of the Nile. According to a great high priest of ancient Egypt by the name of Unefer, H-U-N-E-F-E-R, he wrote a papyrus. It's known as the papyrus of Unefer, the paper of Unefer. He said, we came from the beginning of the Nile where God happy dwells at the foothill of the mountain of the moon. <coughs> the mountain of the moon, there are two places in Egypt, I mean in Africa named mountain of the moon. One is between Ethiopia and or Kenya and Tanganyika, called Kilimanjaro, means mountain of the moon. The other is in Uganda, Renzori. It also means mountain of the moon. So when you look at it, there's two bodies of water that make up the Nile here. The Nile came down as a body of water from Ethiopia called the Blue Nile. The White Nile is a body of water from Uganda. Both of these bodies of waters meet in Khartoum in Sudan. They continue from further north from the south and they meet another body of water out of the Ethiopian highland and that's called the Atbara River. And in Atbara, Sudan, those other two bodies meet. Therefore, from then on to here and to the Mediterranean, which was called the Great Sea, that body of water, the Nile, has been the one that played the highway for a major civilization that started in Central East Africa and reached its zenith in this land. And so you're saying then that the people of Central Africa m migrated north up along this river? Yes, I'm saying that the original high culture, where the people first start to make scratches, symbols, writing down, heretic and so forth, finally develop into al alphabetical presentations, mathematical signs, uh, religious signs and, sex and symbols and so forth, they actually had their beginning in Central East Africa. All right, so there were several thousand years that encompassed this dynastic period that preceded the birth of Christ. If you deal with Manetho's figure, it would be from 4100 BC. 4,000 years. Yes, and to 30. Now, this uh, if you deal with other figures like Mariette, uh, Budge, uh, um, Maspero and others, they got varying period or varying dates for the beginning of the dynastic period. All right. Now this is a long period of time. Um, there were several kings or pharaohs and queens. A lot happened in this period. There were wars. If someone wanted to get an overview of what was the most significant periods in this 4,000 odd year period. What would you point to? What kings were the most significant or pharaohs? What queens were the most important? In reality, that's very hard to do. Hmm. However, since we all have opinions, the 18th dynasty would consider to be the one with the most action. However, I would have to say the first dynasty in that that brought into effect all that happened after that. Uh, man, what happened is this southern man, the country was divided into two, the north and the south. This man in the south, Nama, a king, organized his other vassals, other small kings, against the man in the north to have a unity, a man called Scorpion. They met in a battle a battle for unity. Either the South was going to control the North or the North was going to control the South. And they met at a place called Memnefa to the called Memphis. The war was fought there and the men from the South, Nahmud, won. He took his concept of the deity, God, Ra, against the man who lost his concept of the deity, Amen. You would think that he would put Ra in front since he's the one that won, but no, he was wise. Psychologically, he said, no, I wouldn't change. 
he let the God of the North be the first to be mentioned, and thus he made one God out of two, Amen Ra. So the people in the North said, this must be a good man. He let our God be the first to be mentioned. And all of this was devised in a place called Memphis. Memnepha or Memphis. Now, if we were to go to Memphis, what would we see today? Are there anything that's remnant of that period? Very little. You would see some statues by Ramesses II, uh, one at least uh, about 40 feet, 30, 40 feet. Uh, two in the yard, general yard, one of them having come to Tennessee when the Ramesses exhibit that come there. Another one almost as large and some other smaller uh, statues. But the main buildings uh, of the Temple of God, Ptah. Ptah was in the mythology, the God who made gods, responsible for making gods. The God of all gods. The God of all gods. And you would see his, uh, what's left of his temple, just sporadic pieces of foundation here and there. There isn't at least a quarter floor, or the height of a quarter floor, any place. Was this done in Ramesses' lifetime? The, the statue, yes. It was, yes. Does he order, did he order things like you this? Know, you know it is in his lifetime, why? Why? Because he is standing on the life foot. Left yes. foot forward. If he was standing this way, it would be, you know, he's dead. He's dead when he he's dealing. together. But he's standing this way, he's alive. Very near to Memphis is a place called Saqqara, where the world's first pyramid was built, although it was shaped somewhat differently. Dr. Ben showed us. Did the Pharaoh design this pyramid and order its building, or did somebody else? No. As a matter of fact, he had no business business at all with it. The idea came from his prime minister who was also an architect. As a matter of fact, he was a multi-genius, the first one recorded in all of human history. You got to consider we're talking about about 2800 BC. Uh, this man called I-M-O-Tep or for short Imhotep. He didn't want his pharaoh to be buried like other pharaohs. He thought his pharaohs should be buried in a much more glorious state than the wood uh, burial place that they had prior. So he decided, when looking around, I, I, better use, I could use this material, it lasts forever. And thus he set a stone, lying stone, and said, I'm going to build it out of this. But there were building uh, burial places out of uh, this wood in a square. So he decided, well, look, I'll just use a stone or stones and the same procedure, and that will last. But when he was finished, he said, gee, it's going to last, but it, it looks like nothing. So he decided to put uh, another layer on the top and recess them, set them back, and six of them set back, look something like wet cake. They become steps, and thus the term step pyramid. That's uh, up the Nile, brought us to the temple of Pharaoh Ramesses II at Abu Simbel. Breathtaking to behold. You can't look at these and say they weren't Africans who are doing this. Why would they put somebody else's face? <laughs> Well, it's an artistic rendering. I, uh, they, they didn't have e equipment to make thin lips and to make uh, no. narrow doors, so <laughs> they had to use that and it wouldn't make... But then the little details of a fingernail, <laughs> they had the equipment for that, but not for the, for, the, for, the, for the thin lips. Is it important, though, to say that Africans did this? Oh, yes. If, if no one had said the Africans didn't do it, it wouldn't be important. But since that had been said for no reason at all, they wanted to satisfy themselves that although they, didn't, they were not in history, that they did it. Now, since it is that the people whose ancestors did it could not say anything about it in the past, now is the time that they declare to the world whose legacy it is. <laughs> 
All four of these figures are of the same man. Ramesses the second. Ramesses ruled for about 67 years and he was an engineer and really? and is known to have commissioned not only that his, his west his architect was known to at many times had him come and do some supervision like our symbol it said that he supervised the building of our symbol himself so he was an engineer he was also an engineer he was a very accomplished man so would he be qualified to be called a priest uh, he studied in the priesthood. He took the reign of his father in 1298 uh, uh, when his father died. Ah. And he ruled till 1232. Some people vary a, a few years one way or the other. Some say 1230, some say, but yeah, around two years isn't going to make a difference. How long did he live? He, li he ruled from 1298, according to Manito's figure, until 1232, 67 years. But how long did he live? I lived there to be 100, uh, 98, something like that. 98 years? 98, 97 years old. And he had how many offspring, do you know? Well, <laughs> he had as many offspring as you got guides. <laughs> some <laughs> say this, so he had many wives, some said 200 offspring, somebody said 100 offspring, some 30, 40. I don't know, but quite a lot. And wives? <laughs> how many wives did he have? Quite a lot. Quite a lot, but who was his favorite wife? His favorite wife was Nefertari the second. What would, what would possess somebody to look at something this magnificent and mark it up like that and defile it with their name? Eh? There are many factors. One, hate. <laughs> Two, hate. grudge. Uh, uh, four, their own smallness. And five, it's a means of saying, I did it. Now, in between these figures is a passageway. What's in there? Ah, that's to get into the temple. That is an actual temple with a hypostyle hall, although there are only four columns on each side. Uh, and then on the wars, you will see the wars that Ramesses II fought with the Hittites and others. Of course, none, no record of the war, any war with the Hebrews, none whatsoever. Right. And at the end of the corridor, there's a little chamber. What's that? There is what you call the antechamber, and the next chamber to that last would be the Holy of Holies or the sanctuary. Holy of Holies. And inside the Holy of Holies would have the triad. Like you have the Trinity. Yes. That's where the concept of ancient Egyptian in every city had a holy trinad, tr a triad, T-R-I-A-D, three gods. Normally, a god, a goddess, and a god. A god, the father, a goddess, the mother, and a god, the son. The holy trinity that Christianity adopted. You notice this side. These are supposed to be the ancient captives of war, of Ramesses II. You know this out? Mm -hmm. Carefully. Now let's shift side. These are supposed to be Nubians or generally Africans, but they are tied the exact same way as these on the side. Yet, in America, in the classroom, these are called Negro slaves of Ramesses. But these are called, in the same textbook, by the same professors, Asian captive or Semitic captives. Prisoners of war. No. no. Prison, yes, prisoners of war here, but slaves there. Now, what made the difference? Go and see. I can't possibly imagine. All right, my brother. <laughs> Yeah. Is this the full extent of the lights I can put on, or are there more lights? <laughs> Dr. Ben, what are we looking at here? What is he filming? That is the opet procession, the procession of the priests. And after Ramesses come back from war, and he's victorious, it is the procession of the priests. Here, here is before God Ptah, 
He's in front, Ramesses is in front of God Pitar. Appealing for long life. What are we looking at? The war of the Hittites against Egypt. Ramesses pursuing and fighting the Hittites. If you notice the figures, show you the strictly African characters. So that's him on top of the chariot. Him and his chariot. And, the, and he's the, driving them out. Uh, yes, right. That's Ramesses slain one of the enemies. And he wouldn't be slain an ordinary soldier. He's slain either the, the, the mayor or the king, but he don't be, it wouldn't be shown slain, slain because his men killed the regular men. Who was he killing though? Oh, the Hittites. The Hittites. Hittites. And who were the Hittites? They the came. Hittites are people from Asia. All right. And there he is again. That's right. And notice... Waging war. That's right. Yeah. And there, there he is wearing a, a suit with a penis cup, by the way. That and is to protect... he's slaying his enemies. He's uh, slaying the enemies. As we left, Dr. Ben explained that this magnificent temple was originally located much closer to the Nile River and was recently moved. So they had to raise this 100 feet up and back 600 feet. Five nations assigned their best engineers to move these temples to higher ground to avoid them being engulfed by the rising waters from the newly constructed Aswan Dam. The monuments could not be moved intact, so they were painstakingly cut into smaller blocks and reassembled at this present location. The rescue effort cost a then estimated $36 million and was hailed as an engineering miracle. And rightly so. But what then does one say of those who originally created all of this, some 3,287 years ago? And this is the temple of Nefertari. The second. The second. This was Ramesses' favorite. It's most favorite what? This is Ramesses. And he lived? To 99? How about 97? 97, I'm sorry. Good night. Yes, I, I think he was that. Now this is Ramesses again. This is Ra Ramesses. That's, and Ram a, and that's a goddess. That's, that's Hathor. Hathor, I can tell by the horns. It's Ram that's that's Nefertari. And see the graffiti there too. The mark of graffiti and them yeah. all over. It's going sir. Typical of the behavior. What do we have in here, Dr. Ben, on this wall here? The same thing. You have God for us or, or blessing the king. And here again. You have the uh, God Ptah also blessing the king, King Ramesses II. I Nefertiti see. in front of Ptah. Now this is a now, goddess. Yes, no, it's by it's, her headdress. It's, uh, uh, but Nefertiti come in, in the person of goddess Hathor. I see. And paying honor to, to the king Ptah. What is this depicting here? She is uh, visiting Gade. She is again paying homage to Goddess Hathor. Remember what I said? Hathor comes with the sun disc between the horn of the cow. Right. Now we know it's Hathor. If you put a little uh, chair, the throne, on the top, it becomes what? Osiris. Isis. Isis, I'm sorry. If you put a maze, it becomes her sister, Nephthys. How? Was this work done? Which is it? They gouged out. This is granite. Yeah. But and they gouged it out. Uh -huh. They chiseled it out. Now, in some work, where they didn't chisel, they take the work and they put a thin layer of plaster. Yes. And when the plastic was damp, they put a plaque, a, a, come up, a plate of the design, likely. Then they came and d draw it over it. But in this case, where they got the chisel into the material, it was done with hammer and chisel. And what about when, when in place, not on the ground? They first they put the stone up, then they do the finishing while it's up. 
colors. Where did they get their colors from? Ah, from clay, from tree barks, and they flowers. made their own color. Flowers, different way. They made different and kinds of stain and dyes with the color. To last this long, huh? Oh, yes. Because they put it in the mortar, <laughs> and it goes in, it penetrates. This was a place then for all people to come and worship. It's a temple. Worship but the temple. temple was in the name of Goddess Hathor. Goddess Hathor. Nefertari Temple for Goddess Het Heru. Goddess Hathor. Hathor or Het, listen, Het, wife Heru, wife of Horus. Now, what is the significance of the figures being seated? Well, the pharaoh was at rest and he's sitting on his throne. Okay. See, next to him, on his side is his throne. Mm -hmm. And because uh, Nefertari's feet are one in front of the other, she's alive. Oh, the whole thing is alive. And, right. and, and you know he's alive, he's sitting on the throne. The only how you would know that he's dead if he had the crossed his hands. No. Even if the foot together is sitting down, he has to have crossed his hand, which he would could do sitting down also, like an X. And then you will see the flail in one hand. Yes. Uh -huh. and, and the that crook. Means, and so the crook in the other. That means he's dead. He's dead. But he's one of the pharaoh who in real life had a beard. Because even in alive they put a beard in him. Look at those lips. <laughs> There, I Look can, at that nose. Can you say I see my father there? <laughs> and his ancestors? I mean, there can be no doubt about it. How it's not Charlton Heston. Yeah, no. <laughs> and and, and the Atari is not Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> Thank you. I noticed that the, between his knees there are cartouches. What did I say? His name. Uh, Amen Mary Ra. Ah. Ra, Mary, Amen. Ramesses. Ra, Mary, Amen. So that's a standard that they established to identify themselves as the cartouche. The, the monarch was represented by the cartouche. If you don't see the cartouche, you can't say. You might have seen a statue look exactly and say, this is so and so. You can't say it because there's no cartouche. To be sure, you must have the cartouche. But now to identify the god and the goddesses, you don't necessarily need the cartouche because oh. it's the head, yes. and the headdress. Yes. That never changed for the... One goddess is never shown with the other goddess uh, up here. It, in, you got to be careful in only three cases. Nefertari? I'm sorry. Isis or Aset? Yes. Het Heru or Hathor? And Nephthys. You got to be careful of them because they are represented with a cow's horn. All of them? And a disc in the, within the cow so horn. So how do you tell between? Uh -huh. On top the disc, you have a little throne. That's Isis. Yes. Without the disc, yes. it's Hathor. And yes. with a little maze, it's Nephthys. That. <laughs> right. That's the way you tell one for the other. Because yes. if, if you never, if you see it with one, it's impossible to be. If you see the 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 throne and the and the and the disc, it's impossible to be anybody else than ISIS. So and if you, to, just to keep you alert, they, they, they make you that, huh? they make you look for that loan to see who it is. <laughs> Abu Simbel, early enough to visit another temple that had been rescued from the rising waters created by the dam, the temple at Philae. What god is this temple um, honoring? Maybe more so goddess. Goddess. Goddess Aset or Ast, otherwise called Isis. Isis is the sister of her husband, God Asaru, Asar, otherwise called Osiris. When was this built and under whose uh, dynastic reign? 
Well, the earliest period for this will go back to the Roman period, the Greek period. Mm -hmm. And the Greek period doesn't start any earlier than 332 B.C. because the Greeks came to Egypt as conquerors during 332. But it didn't start at that particular time. It is supposed to have been started during around 70 or so uh, before the Common Era. Before we get into uh, more of the religious meaning, just architecturally, this whole alignment, the alignment the of colonies. these columns is uh, just magnificent. And it's, an it's just an architectural wonder unto itself. Did it have a ceiling? Uh, was it covered? Yes, you could see some of the slabs there. It was all covered. But you would notice something else so that you could no no notice that this column over here isn't finished, isn't complete. Yes. That show you that all that beautiful thing you see, you notice that they're in different stages. They would bring the stone and put them in place. Then they would carve them. That's a very important note. But you also would note that there is a difference in the typical ancient Egyptian column as against these. These have made transformation in the design. I see. And whereas you will see, these are multiplicity of design concepts in there. And as you go up, you see the difference in change. Here you notice the one, the fluted part is very narrow. Yes. With, with three bands, four bands. Whereas a little further up, let's take the third one, the fluted column is wider. The flute at a uh, wider dimension. I see what you. Now, are all temples including this one basically the same in structure that there's an anti-chamber and it goes back until you get to the holy of holies basically they start out with a people's court mm -hmm. open and then if it's a large temple it will be other courts with different pylons or uh, that would be a pylon there'll be inner pylons now after that there will be a hypostyle hall hall of column or otherwise called a pillared hall after that, there'll be an anti-chamber, which would be prior to the Holy of Holies. Which now, is always at the end. The, generally, the Holy of Holies is the last room to the east. Most of the worship temple are on the east bank. Most of the funerary temple are on the west bank. And the reason for that is Ra rises, God, Ra rises in the morning and comes up in the east. In the night, Ra goes to the next world, go to sleep, and go down in the west. These two major edifices here, there are figures that were there, and they've been chipped away. Who was depicted here, and who chipped them away, and why? Well, the central figure in this, all of these scenes, in this particular uh, our temple, would be Goddess Isis. This is her temple. And when you look at this, you will see Goddess Isis and other gods, God Horus, which, by the way, is her son. But you're, you're dealing with Horus, or Heru, as the proper name would be, at various period of his life. You would see then uh, various gods, you see there, Goddess uh, Hathor, which became the surrogate mother of God Heru. So the story is going to give you, from here, you will see other phases of this when you go to other temples. When we go inside, we will see that the uh, early Christians put, set their cross, and they're going to put them on columns and on the walls. They set their, uh, temp their um, various uh, instruments for worship, like uh, altar and so forth. You mean they commandeered this temple for their own uses? Right. They, they considered heathen and pagan, but they used the same heathen and pagan temple for their own church. This is the purification rites or baptism. You see the water, symbolically the water, comprises of the ankh yes. and the was scepter. Both mm. things together, in, intermittently, ankh, was scepter, ankh, was scepter as the water. See, they're hanging down there at the bottom. Mm -hmm. and, and this Who is, the, is being baptized? The Pharaoh. 
Now, as we go back in here now, that is the, the altar of, that the Christians use. The but, original altar that the ancient Egyptian used, that has gone. But it was in that room that was known as the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies or the sanctuary. And that was... In Only sense, the high priest. In the sense then that was violated. Oh yes, oh yes. That is the most sacred part of the temple. Our tour was now in full stride as we left Aswan and headed north, that's down the Nile, toward the city of Luxor with all its many important temples that you will see in our next special edition. Or Egypt. Affectionately known as Dr. Ben. We began in Cairo seeing the great pyramids at Giza. And then we came south and saw the majestic temples at Abu Simbel. And in Aswan, we visited the Philae Temple out in the middle of the Nile. Dr. Ben explained to us some of the writings on the temple walls. People in the, in the States argue in all the time that the ankh comes from the cross, not at all. There is an ankh and there is a cross. Ankh there and a cross to your left and up. They, they mean two different things have always meant two different things. Never has one been an order. Outside the main temple are lesser temples. Now this is off of the main temple which is behind us. What is this here? This is a kiosk. What's that Or mean? a small little chapel. And it's the chapel belonging to goddess Hathor, Het Heru. Now, what's unique about this temple, if you come here, Phil, look at there. And you see God Bess. This was originally the original God of the Nile, God of the life, because the life was life source. Now you see Bess playing every instrument there is. The harp, which you thought was a European instrument. Here is God Bless playing the tambourine. Here. Here is God Bless playing the flute and the canobo. Here is over there playing in the form of a monkey playing what Farouk call the electric guitar. Here is it. Look, look at like any <laughs> electric. Here he is playing a, a bassoon. Here, here, you see what I mean? He, he's playing all the major instruments that you thought were European. Why you say that? I knew that. I knew this a long time ago. Yeah, well, I just want to refresh your memory. <laughs> <laughs> the back of this lesser temple looks out on a lake created by the building of a dam, which would have engulfed the temple had it not been disassembled and moved to this higher ground. These are the remnants that they took out from that oh, old yeah, site. They, yeah. And sooner or later, they're going to be restored somewhere oh, here. Oh, here. Mm -hmm. These remnants are going here. Uh -huh. Build this uh, temple here. They got 5,000 another island which they will also bring here as money come available you know something what i noticed here there's some colors there yes of red and blue right right towards the top and the back yes yes some of the original that brilliant blue color i remember now that right up here this, towards the top yes yes i remember that that and uh, some down by that the little roof there too. Yeah. And I remember uh, some here, different places. But remember, this, this was mostly underwater all year round. We boarded a launch across the Nile to meet our bus to go to Luxor. We saw a hotel that was in business during British rule. Dr. Ben was barred from staying here at that time. And then we were on our way to historic Luxor. It stops along the way at two important temples laden with information, as you will see. This is the temple of Komombo, the double temple of the crocodile-headed god Subic and the falcon-headed god Harois. When was this built and uh, who built it? This was originally a temple before the Roman period and the Greek period. However, when the Greeks came as conquerors, they ordered a temple be built here, and this also called the Roman, uh, the Greek period. And that 
was done by the Ptolemies. Is this the same concept in all the temples that you go back, back into different... Yes and no. Yes and no. The open court, the hypostyle hall, the antechamber, and the Holy of Holies, but this is a double temple. What you have on one side, you also have on the other side. So you have two Holy of Holies in this temple. I see. Now I see Horus. And this is a good part of the baptism, isn't it? Yes. There you have, in this case, there you have Horus, or Horakti, and you have the Pharaoh, the Ptolemy, and you have the god of scribes, the god of historians, and that will be Tahuti. The Greeks call him Thot. Are these original colors here? Oh, those are some of the original. That, that goes oh. back to the original. Boy, this must have been just gorgeous. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This is the purification rites, or baptism of the Pharaoh. This is the god Tahuti, sometimes called Thut, if you're using from the Greek way. He is holding the jar, the goblet, with the holy water, and on the opposite side is Haroes, holding another. They're pouring the holy water over the Pharaoh. Which Pharaoh? This is Ptolemy 11th, or, right. or Ptolemy 12th. You notice that the holy water is made up of ank and was scepter. Ank, was scepter, ank, was scepter. The ank is the key of life, the symbol of the key of life. The was scepter is the highest authority of the king. So baptism didn't take place when you were an infant? Oh no. Well, baptism goes back for thousands of thousands of years, long before the story of Jesus and and John the Baptist. But, the, but uh, contrary to the way we've been taught to think of baptism, it took place when you were grown. Oh yes. Now what's it the next? The next is the uh, preparation of the coronation scene with the uh, putting of the crown and the Pharaoh's head. And here you have the god Nit and goddess putting, the gods, goddesses, Nit and another one, putting the, the crown on the king's head. And Horus witness it. Horus is carrying the was scepter. You remember you just saw the was scepter? The, yes. and the thing? This is the highest authority, the word was scepter. And you can see that's Horus because it's the head of the falcon. He's carrying the head of the falcon on the head, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the disc of a god uh, Ra, on the head. And here you have Goddess Hathor and the queen. Cleopatra. This is Cleopatra. Cleopatra. One of the better uh, image of her that you would see. But it's not around. too not too much like Liz Taylor, though. Oh no, not at all. <laughs> and the hair? Uh, no, not at all. That is actually um, you could see uh, coarse hair, coarse curl up, and then here is God Horus again, over on the right. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Heroes, in this case. Dr. Ben, what is this? This is an, is an ancient calendar uh, of the times when they was based upon the lunar, the lunar calendar. If you would notice, it is based upon the moon and then the sun. For instance, one, two, three, four, four, and four is eight, the month, eight month. This would be two, four, five, the fifth no, month, Above the fourth, the see, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth month, see, the eleventh month, and so forth, so that you know what year it was, what month. Did they have the 365 day? 365 and a quarter day, corrected each fourth year, but they had a 13 month calendar. There was 12 months of 30 days each and one month of five days.
Go ahead. Here is another scene. This is very important because it shows the Pharaoh paying homage to goddess Isis, or goddess Aset, sitting on the bird chair. What do you mean, what, uh, bird chair? What do you mean? She, this is how deliveries were made from a, a stool like that? Right. And if you notice her breast, yes. that it's full. Yes. Full of uh, lactation for when she has a baby. And notice again that the stomach is large. Yes. Showing yes. that she, she's pregnant. But equally, you notice they were prepared just in the event that she had any trouble. Here is the surgical instrument. If she had running into trouble. All oh, these uh, surgical yes. scissors. Scissors, the knives, the scalpel. The scalpel up here. Up there. You have those little things that they use the to retractors. Retractors and everything like that. Isn't that something? Uh, those were old instruments. And here is the man, Imhotep, who used to be the great uh, Sakara, the step That's perfect. right. And look at this, where you used to wash Thank the you. hand. To keep, you see, they said that Pasteur and Madame Curie and all of them started to think about cleanliness. This is way back there. One had to wash one hand but before one committed surgery. You know what I noticed about these temples? They've been worked and reworked and reworked over. Right, so they were different period. And, and each period they did their own thing on it. Uh, somebody came and either occupied or oh, continued. Oh, what's and this? What's if you this? notice all the way down, the water would come in from the river. And this is a Nile-ometer or nile o -meter. My, my, my. So you could see the different level as the water darkens the, around the rim here. So the crocodile can... would come, they would get the crocodile come in and they'll catch the largest and the strongest cr crocodile and keep it here in, with the, in the Nilometer. Plus, they will know when the high tide, they will know when the flood is coming down because this will get higher and higher. And since the rains come in Ethiopia and Uganda around July and August, by September, it would come, but they would see it when it's coming because... Oh, in advance. Because it, the water would rise. Oh, this would uh, sort of forecast. Right. It. And they would also be able to tell the taxes, ah. the taxation based upon the height of the water. Ah. Means how much water they're going to get and how much silt they're going to go up. They, they know from just here in the meter. You know something? While I have you here, I've noticed that in the tour groups, I haven't seen many tour groups of color here. No. Uh, in 1957, there wasn't one. I introduced the first one in 1957, a few professors, as a matter of fact, it was nine people. And I kept bringing 10, 9, 5, things like of that number. The first large group came in 1978. It was a group from you brought? California I brought. Uh, they came from Watts, the Penon uh, Institute out there, uh, medical group, it was by Dr. King and others, and they, they were called a NUS group. Well, without getting into too much detail, my question is, why don't we see many groups here of color? Even to this day, 1994? Because our people have been given a bill of goods that only the western part of Africa we could relate to. We've been trained that way by the school system, by the churches, by the synagogues, the mosques, and everything that we had nothing to do with this part of the world. And that's been the mission of your life, to that's, correct that. It's to show it, quite to the contrary. All right, let's press on. Oh. Our next stop was at the huge temple at Edfu. This is the big one. It's the biggest singular temple except for Karnak. Karnak, Warik. Uh, because Warik is a series of temples within a temple. 
How many pharaohs added that were involved with this temple? Eight. Eight? <laughs> That's all? That's all. Ramesses had his hand in here. Oh, yes, everywhere. Mm -hmm. There's no place that he didn't have a hand. All right, so there is the pharaoh. The pharaoh, Gre Thor. pharaoh Britain Horus. Yep. See, you got it down, Horus. That's him. I, listen, don't mess with the kid. I know now. <laughs> you beat me up enough, I know. <laughs> <laughs> You will notice that the architecture is the same kind of thing with a quadrangle. And then you have your series of columns. The series of columns here follow the pattern that you will see in uh, Abydos. The, the columns, the colonnades as a part of the courtyard. You will see colonnades here as a, the same type of colonnades in when you get to uh, Luxor in the temple at Luxor in Warit, you see the colonnades. In addition to being a place of worship and a place to document their stories and their religious uh, stories, uh, did the pharaohs and the priests live here? They live in, next to the uh, palaces where they were going to be buried. What do you mean palaces? The, the king's palace was where the burial uh, place would be more than we where they worship. They never, they never lived where the worship temples were. Why haven't we seen any of the palaces? We, we haven't survived. We haven't been to a mortuary pa palace yet. Uh -huh. All the palaces we've been gone thus far is worship temples. When we go to the West Bank, we have not been in the West Bank yet. Do you have any idea why these courtyards are so huge? Ah, well, they built monuments to the deity. They were building to the deity and they built large, colossal things to the deity, to saying to the deity, I pay tribute to you. Now, how did they get up there to do the inscribing upon well, the edifices there? Well, that was easy. They built scaffold. That was easy. When they get up to there, they would build a scaffold and they had ramps. What we are looking here is a dramatization of the story of Horus revenging the murder of his father by his uncle. You would notice that he lanced harpoons, the hippopotamus representing his father because he's a god and you can't show a god being killed. So this hippopotamus is a symbol, the symbol of the bad god which is his uncle, Seth Typhon. And what do we have over he, here? He turns up the, the animal, Hippopotamus, but they continue the struggle with the bad god, the Hippopotamus. There it is, see? And he harpoons him. All right. He continue down, and as you see, the different gods and goddesses in the him. story. They're assisting him, because remember, they're killing the evil god. This was a treacherous murder. It's a treacherous murder. He had killed his un uncle two times. This is the second time. First, he hanged his uncle. The second time, he had hung him again, but cut him up into two pieces. Uh, I'm sorry, 14 pieces. The one piece that was missing was missing because he had been eaten by the Nile catfish, but that we will see elsewhere. Here, they are being greeted. See the ladies hitting the tambourine? He is greeted, coming in here, and he has already killed Horace. Now here, the, over here to the left, is the hippopotamus. Much bigger now. It's much bigger. And here, but one thing I want to bring to your attention, he kills him with a harpoon. Yes. Yet they told us in school that the Swedes invented the harpoon. This, they know Sweden when this story is. They know still Sweden when they made this temple. And yet we have a harpoon. So somebody had a harpoon long before the Swedes had it. At the top 
are of Hatho, is that correct? Yes. All of it. In and there. All, all, Excuse, of, these all of the column heads are Hatho. In order to, to um, hack away and chisel away all of this work, uh, those who did it had to erect scaffolding. Uh, most of them erected ladders because scaffolding they didn't have as much material, but they made they had little stuff in them, but most of it was done with ladders. The point I'm trying to make is that it took a lot of effort. Oh, yes. To really do such damage to this magnificent temple. The time they took to do this, they could have built their own building. The point is that they condemned this building, they destroyed the things in there, and then used the building. They called the bigot building pagan, and the people pagan, and heathen, and all that. But they use the same building that they condemn as pagan. Why well, you, you can't show MGM movies in a Paramount building. They take some water and call it holy water, sprinkle it around, say a few prayers, and that makes the pagan building become a good Christian building. Okay. This is what? Uh, some sort of a... This is a chapel, a small I... chapel. And as a matter of fact, it's a chapel of Goddess Newt. How Part do you spell that? N-U-T, uh, pronounced right. Newt. Some people write it N-O-U-T. And what is the significance of this? The ceiling? If you look, you would notice Goddess Newt's head here, her hands hanging down there, her body comes this way, her foot goes down, down, and then you see the sun, God Ra, comes as the sun, sun with all its rays. And the rays coming from her, the sun comes out of her vagina, and the rays go over Goddess Hathor. Hathor holding the tree of life, and her head is staying on a mountain. Then you see the, the sun going back in the night as the moon and going back through her body. She takes it back through her mouth, it goes again around her body and comes out through her vagina constantly. So because the, the world cycle, never ends. The whole cycle of life then? As yes, sir. world never ends. Revolves around the female. The, yes. You're coming out now. Oh, boy. We're on the top of this temple now. <laughs> and what is this? This is a sundial. It was made for the room to tell time. How does it work, you know? Well, the sun cast a shadow in here. And they had a, 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 a compass with the time of the world. And the sun would, as it moves up to the fulcrum, it would cast a shadow and they could tell what time of the day it was. So all of that is long gone. Yes. That's How did you know then that it, it was this? Well, it was here and we know, seen it in other, other temples. I know what this is. I see. And all you right. notice, by the way, the faces of Hatha yes. is all gone again. I can tell by the cow ears, but the, again, it's all the face. And the, and, the, and, and the hair. These are keys which indicate wall. In other words, this is what the, yeah. there was the a column wall. was anchored into, the, these little There was a wall here. See the wall? Yeah. Were you sitting on? This is it, huh? That's right. That was weird. See that? Ah. I see. There was a wall this wide. These were anchored. I see. A wall this wide. And there's other keys on top of that, so this wall was quite high. Went, went up. Wow. See, because they had to earthquake, they had to anchor these stones. They couldn't just put one in and depend on the weight. You had earthquake. So they used the key, but never mortar. No, no mortar. Wow. Egypt is the mother of war, the Western world civilization. It didn't start here. It started where Hunnafis said at the beginning of the Nile, but it reached its zenith here.
The whole world must look to Egypt. The entire world, bar not a single country, every high culture must come here for the beginning of what they are. I don't care if it's Jewish, if you're Christian, or you're Muslim, if you're Greek, or you're Roman, you must come here. There, here is where it started along the Nile, and here it, re it reaches Zenith. If you're talking about Avram, Abraham, you're talking about uh, uh, Moses, they, they were here. Moses, was, they said, was born here in a place called Goshen. Abraham came here and received his education. He had no education before he came here. All of them came here. The, the, the whole thing about the Ten Commandments came out of the 42 negative confessions. Dr. Ben is teaching reverse racism. They call it what they want. They could, I don't know what they call it. The fact is, if a teacher come here and prove me wrong, I'll go any way they got and show them what they wrote, where it came from, and carry them to where it came for them to see it. The point is, my evidence still exists. They can't show me Adam, Adam and Eve, but I could show them Osiris. Luxor, and set out across the Nile for the Valley of the Kings on the West Bank. We passed through a small village and got a different kind of visual treat. It was market day. We got a chance to look at the everyday folk of today's Egypt. But our business was history. This is the temple of Ramesses III and others. But well, what's unique about this guild is that the first, the oldest plus toilet is still here. You gotta be kidding. Yeah. A flush the, toilet. Yes, I'm gonna show yeah. you. Where? When we go, go here. here. Go into the next section. As a matter of fact, you still, still smell the doo-doo. Yes, sir. Now how did that work? Now. There was a bucket up here, and they will tilt the bucket when the first person is finished. It was also a shower here. I see. And then when they tilt the bucket, it would flush the water. As you notice there, there's a yes, trough. There's a trough. This will go down, and, and there's there a hole down there. The water will run out and go into a flush system. And how old is this? This goes back at least the 20th dynasty, about 1100 and add before the common era before Christ. 1100 before Christ. Uh, where was Rome at that time? Didn't exist. A hundred years at least before there was a Rome or Greece. Interesting. Interesting. Now this is a side of the temple, Dr. Ben. But boy, is this dug out deep. Why? They did that to avoid destruction by the people who came and defaced temples. So they make this very deep. If you, even the attempt to deface it in terms of this death was done. You have, by the way, you got your hand, you just touch the a scene from the Nile. See the different type of yeah, fish. Yeah, there's a duck chasing the fish. That's right, and you can see the different types. Uh, I a, see. A mullet, uh, a snapper and so forth. But this was really designed to uh, frustrate anybody who wanted to deface. deface the property. In other words, they had experienced it already. Oh yes, he's, he's come now in the 20th he who? dynasty. Ramesses III. Ramesses he's in the, the 20th third. dynasty. And all, he's had at least all the way from the, the, the temples going back to the 17th dynasty all the way has been so defaced. So most of the figures in this temple then are cut deep like this. Oh yes. Oh, yes. Okay, well then let's go inside the courtyard again. <laughs> Lord, what a huge, 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 huge court. Now, where are we now? That is the colonnade with Statues, every one of those statues is a finger of Ramesses III. And you notice he, he used the same 
method of presenting himself and his sons My. as Ramesses II did. This is huge. Yes. This is just... It's colossal. Colossal. And when you consider, it goes all the way back in the gill. How long did it take to do this? And where did they get the, the stones from? Well, local stone. No, the marble, where you use marble, that came from Aswan. Where you use the limestone, it came from the local quarries. Now, what would this courtyard be used for? The multitudes, the common people would the come here, as they, they're called? The common people come, and the priests, the, yeah, and the priests address them. All right, but could the masses go any further inside? No, there's stuff here. Now, on the right here, on this wall, which is just off this huge courtyard, the faces look, they don't look African on the right here. Those are Asian people. Are these the invaders? These are the invaders. As a matter of fact... And they're bearing arms. Yeah, yeah, but they're not the invaders in this particular case because Ramesses went to Asia and fought them. They had invaded before. They're forced back and now Ramesses pursue them so that they are fighting now an Asian territory. All right, but now as you move further to the left, you see that they're actually meeting in combat here. You, but the one then, has a sword. You, you notice that the distinct difference in features. Well, as the, you move to the left, right, yes. You then see at the, where the two combatants meet together, you see one is an Asian and one is an African. You see African with long pleated hair. You notice the face, the, the see facial, the, lips and the nose and the lips, so you got no doubt. Yeah. And they're wrestling there. And they're, they're wrestling, they're fighting. Uh, but some are falling, others are standing up. The battle is going on. The Africans fighting for Egypt and the Asians fighting for Persia. What is the significance uh, of looking at this? The significance for me in this particular case is to show that there were Africans and the Egyptians were fighting as Africans and they fought people as Asians. Showed us the remnants of a statue of Ramesses II, which weighed over 100,000 tons intact. We also saw workmen who were working to restore this funerary temple site. This funerary temple was where Ramesses II's corpse was prepared for burial. And Dr. Ben also showed us some Roman arches that weren't built by Romans. Those are archways for the granary. When the Pharaoh Ramesses II had his complex, for the men who were working here, they had a granary where they could store their food and everything. What and is the significance of looking at this? The significance is looking at it to see that in architectural and art school today, they teach that these arch, arches are Roman arches and are Greek arches. And this arch, these arches existed before there was a Rome or a Greece. Ramesses died in 1232 BC, and Rome uh, or Greece wasn't built until at least 1000 BC. And then Dr. Ben threw us a curve. In the Valley of the Kings, he showed us a temple for a queen. Now, Queen Hatshepsut is one of the few women who were pharaohs. The only woman who ruled as a pharaoh. Other women rule as queen, but she's the only woman to rule as a queen and a king simultaneously. She claimed she was not born of an ordinary person, but she was the daughter of a god and a goddess. And that gave her the right to rule as a king and as a queen. What god did she worship? Did she recognize Ra? Yes, Amun Ra, everyone. And the only person who did not worship Ra, per se, was Akhenaten, but everybody did. Amun Ra, she said, was her father. Uh, one of the wonders of this uh, temple of Hatshepsut is where it was selected because it's in sort of a cove, isn't it? It is right up against the mountain. If you went inside, you will find 
that it goes into the mountain. This is the Hippostel Hall or of the chapel. The chapel is in that door where you can't go in. You used to be able to go in, but you can't go in anymore. So all of this was enclosed at one time? Oh, yes. It had a ceiling? Oh, yes, and had a ceiling. It's like a Hippostel Hall. I see. And you notice they ramp up. It yes. ramps up. Yes, yes, yes. It was high. It was high up to the... To high, the high up. up. It went right in there. Right. It we go up higher. get in there now. Uh, no. And behind that door was the signature of her architect. Simut. Simut, which they got a rumor. A rumor. I want to emphasize. Rumor. There's no written proof that she had an affair with her architect. Holy of Holies is in the back? Well, no. In, if you could use as a shrine, there's no Holy of Holies. This is a funeral temple. I see. There wouldn't be. I no. understand. You could look to the right, to the left there. You will see that. And, then you, and every one of these columns, you see the Hathoric head and four, all four sides. Who is this up here? Where? On the that's, next level. That's her husband. Uh, Tutmosis II. That's Tutmosis. You see, her father, you got to know a little history about her. How great she was. When the Hyksos were here, that's the first foreign conquerors of Egypt. Mm. She they stood came up to them? They came from Asia, around the Oxus River. They came and destroyed the 13th dynasty and started the 14th. By the time of the 17th dynasty, dynasty, people here, kings from here, a man by the name of Amus, Amus I, got mad and organized the forces against the Hyksos. To drive them out. To drive them out. He got killed in the battlefield and his son, Totmus I, mm -hmm. took over. Continued the fight. Continued the struggle. He got killed in the battlefield. His daughter, who was who took after him, took over above the second because you were too young. She took over the battle and pursued the Hexus. That daughter would be Hatshepsut. So, uh, Makari Hatshepsut. She was a rough lady. She was a strong woman. She brought women in the government in certain positions, but she did not allow women to interfere with the priesthood, to go into the priesthood. They developed their own system called the priestess, but they were not allowed to participate with the men. Yes. I know we are queen. Plus the fact, plus the fact, Gil, she started what is today you called women's she... liberation. Oh yeah, brother. Women's li today we call women's liberation movement. She had done it thousands of years before. Amen. There are 62 tombs here that are known of. Perhaps the best known of which is the all but vacant tomb of Tutankhamun. Best known because the boy Pharaoh's tomb was discovered intact in the early 1900s. Egyptians working under an Englishman named Howard Carter came quite by accident upon a few steps leading downward. This in November of 1922. Carter was contacted and he ordered the digging to continue. They found the tomb of King Tut, a sensational find. The treasures of this tomb were brought out into daylight for the first time in thousands of years. Works of solid gold, alabaster, and other precious minerals fashioned into exquisite works. Intended not for the eyes of the living, but to accompany the young king on his journey to the afterlife. Then Dr. Ben and I took a look at the tomb of Ramesses IV. If you look at the ceiling, uh, Gil, you start see there are different examples from the papyrus, the very papyri you see, like the papyrus of Annie and so forth. And the wall quotations from the various holy books. Goddess Ma'at to recite the 42 admonitions to, to her, otherwise called the negative confessions. From which came? From which came 10 of them 
came, it's, it's called the Ten Commandments. Moses supposed to have gotten it on Mount Sinai, but he could, I don't know how he could get that when it was already been taught to everyone in Egypt at the education system at Luxa. Luxa was then called what set. The Greeks came and changed that name to Thebes. The Arabs came and changed it to Luxa. What we're not looking at, though, is the architectural achievement. This passageway and this whole t tomb is cut into the side of a mountain. It's cut into the side of a mountain, and then it is smooth, then it is ca uh, carved, and then painted into the beautiful colors you see here. Well, wait, they had to know what they were doing as far as tolerance. They had architect and en engineers. This wasn't haphazard guesswork. And what is this, this, uh, what is this, the tomb S actual? Sarcophagus. And where the body was put into, hermetically sealed. That's the big one, and there was a smaller one inside of that big one. So the, plus the uh, uh, wrappings that the body was in and kept the body for thousands of years. And this is the tomb of Ramesses IV. Ramesses IV, one of the Ramesside kings. The Valley of the Kings looks down on a flatlands area that is almost level with the Nile River. And in this area stands the huge colossus of the pharaoh Amenhotep III. This pharaoh sired a son who would have a major impact on the religious concepts of succeeding civilizations because this son, Amenhotep IV, also known as Akhenaten, formulated the concept of one supreme god, known as monotheism. These gigantic colossus were carved out of a single piece of sandstone. Dr. Ben and his accompanying guide talk to me about these colossus. Why are these colossus so far away from the Valley of the Kings? Yes, they were in front of the temple, if you know the temple. At that time being 18th dynasty, they have been constructed temples so far to mislead the grave robbers. Tell me something. Do you ever have the feeling that they haven't found all the tombs? I, they found the 62 of one period. But there are other pharaohs missing of other periods. And nobody knows where they're buried? No, well, they could be anywhere in Egypt because... Uh, uh, digging in Egypt by luck, <laughs> yes. by chance, like how a Carter has been discovered, King Tut by uh, luck. Uh, but Sherlock. As a, matter, as a matter of fact, it was uh, Sheikh um, Ram, uh, Ram Abdul, Abdul, Abdul Rahman, his, his father yes. was the one that found the tomb. And Howard Carter get the credit. The credit, yeah. Is it true uh, what they're saying that uh, Howard Carter turned out to be a grave robber himself? All of that them. That he kept some of it for himself? All, all of them <laughs> kept for themselves. Kept for themselves. And they sold yes. to museums and they kept for themselves and they sold to museums. But they blamed the people who were equally robbing the tombs. But when they robbed the tombs, they didn't keep the monuments, the um, artifacts to themselves. Somebody got it somebody and, they, and they don't have it, so somebody got it. Dr. Ben told us that most tombs and funerary temples, where the bodies are ready for burial, were located on the west bank of the Nile because the sun sets in the west. On the east bank were the temples of worship for the living, such as those directly opposite the Valley of the Kings, one of which is the largest worship temple ever built. Just wait till you see it. The Valley of the Kings on the west bank of the Nile in the city of Luxor. This hour begins on the East Bank, where Dr. Ben took us to two important temples in Luxor, one of which is described by Dr. Ben as the largest temple ever built, anywhere, at any time, as you will see. For the two temples first. These were built by three main pharaohs. The first was Amenhotep III, then his son, Akhenaten, then Ramesses the second. All right, now, as we turn around, we will see the main entrance to this temple that this walkway leads into. This was the training temple for the priests. Here was oh. where men came at age seven. He remained and for 40 years. 40? 
He has to complete. The training of the priest took 40 years. One could not be a priest unless he was 47. What could entail such a long period of study? Uh, he, he learned the seven liberal arts, engineering, science, mathematics, medicine, law, theology, you name it. The people didn't come here. They, 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 they didn't come in here for anything. Only the priests came in here, the young training priests. The Colossus is Ramesses II. Both of them? Yes. So he had a hand in this too? Oh, he built this section. He built from where the Colossus is to the front. Aha! Uh -huh. He added this section on. Right. This section that changed, you notice the, the, the angle of the main access line. Now beyond, beyond these Colossus, we see these long, tall columns. The Hippostyle Hall. The Hall of Columns. What is that? What went on in there? That's the aisle to go through. Just the passageway? The passageway. What was the relationship between the priest and the pharaoh? The priest was... The, the chief priest was the advisor of the pharaoh, and the priests were under the domination of the chief, chief priest, not the pharaoh. They related to the chief priest. So these priests had a lot of power. Yeah, they, they were the people of knowledge. They advise the aristocrat or, 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 the, or the pharaonic system. They were the head of the educational system, which the Greeks call the mystery system. Now again, I see this passageway begins to ascend, which means we're headed towards the Holy of Holies. Yes, in a sense, that is true in its total sense. However, this particular chamber doesn't move you directly into the whole no, of not court. Yet. No, no, uh -huh. I can see up ahead. Yes, you go into the colonnade, the court of colonnades, the court of the priests, where the priests assemble those in training, and they would walk around these colonnades. You see uh, columns on three sides, double columns, where there's a walk. It's called the colonnade, the colonnade of the priests. Now these columns are fluted. These are fluted papyrus columns, as you see in front of you. Yes. This is the Holy of Holies. When the early Christians came in and occupied this, they painted scenes from the Christian religion. Look at on the wall. Some of them are still remaining. You can oh, see I some can of the see, scenes. But I can see some of the scenes, yes. Right. And all of they painted this also. And they did it over the original. Uh, oh, yes, yes. I see. You could see some of it is gone now, and they painted over the originals. When we start to enter here, you see certain quote unquote Gothic arches with the early Christian use. They took, look at that. Look at that uh, piece of column where it's upside down. Look at the foot, the legs. They didn't worry if, even how they put it. That's upside down. They use the stone from another temple. What about this, uh, this concave entranceway here? Who built that? That was done during the Roman time. They tried to make the imitation of what the Romans had developed by this time. And they put you that mean there. What, what the Africans had developed by this time? But what the Africans had developed, they added to it. I see. When we left the Luxor Temple, Dr. Ben and I walked down a long avenue of sphinxes with ram's heads that once connected the Luxor Temple to the awesome temple of Karnak. So huge and beautiful, it's difficult to describe. It is a temple that started way back in the 12th dynasty. Under which pharaoh? They are not certain. However, it was really Zoom work was resumed on it on the in the 18th dynasty by Amin Hotep the third. Okay, now this is the main entrance, and these are the figures of Amun Ra, uh, in the form of a ram's ram's head. head, a lion body. Standing between the two paws is God Amun Ray, and this is the main entrance, my God. It's the main pylon. As you notice, these stone, the pylon 
this thing was even touched good because you see the rough the stone hair. see it was rough stone all over see now this is done this side more than that side but even so there's hardly any work done comparatively because they had to smooth out this temple here and why because the work you place the stone in place first then you do the finished work and they never got to do that. They never got to do it. Okay. I mean, it would, it would take it would take another century for them to do finish this temple. This is one huge temple. Yes, it's the largest worship temple in the entire world. You can take St. Patrick's Cathedral, St. John the Divine, both in New York. You could take the Canterbury Cathedral. You can take the St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome, all of them, and put them together and run almost the Indy 500 and still got room. <laughs> see, look, this as far is, as your eyes can see. Now, what is this? This is the first courtyard. This is the first courtyard that was the mud ramp that as they you carried go, the rocks up to as go. you go up you lengthen the ramp and you can build you carry up the rocks up there could it be then that this is the same way the pyramids were made exactly the mm. construction to build very high they did it by ramps you keep the same angle so as you go higher you lengthen the ramp that you do you keep the same angle okay now let's talk about some of these things there's a huge column here what is that these columns were built by Tihaka, the pharaoh that came here from Ethiopia, one of the Ethiopian pharaohs. I see. Now, guarding the entranceway, there, there are two statues, and they are Rep they represent death. At this one, one this represent one represent life. Life that that death. one represent death. Of which person? Ramesses the second. Ah, there he is again. Yes, right. All right. And then there, of course, is the ram's head with the lion's ram's body head, all the way around. Same and, as the ram's head you saw outside. And this is an anti-room. No, uh, uh, no, that's the temple of God, Amun, the specific temple. See, the whole thing is the great northern temple of Amun. But that particular one is the temple, the specific temple of Amun himself. So this is a, this temple is huge, but it is... A conglomeration of many temples. Right. All right, now when we leave this enormous courtyard and walk down here, what are we going to see? Well, we go into the Hippostyle Hall. You're going to see 134 columns, 50 feet tall each, and about 7 to 8 feet in diameter. God. Uh, all stone you're going to see all kinds of carvings in it but in particular here gil right up there you see god min that i spoke to you about yes here is it and on every of one of these 134 columns you'll be looking at god min everywhere the god of fertility and elsewhere he dominates this because Ramesses the second though he followed many he followed Akhenaten father Akhenaten father was the first in the in the 18th dynasty to continue this 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 temple these columns supported a ceiling this was yeah. enclosed at one time yes if you will notice there is a low ceiling and there is a high ceiling Yes. At that section was the low ceiling, and you would notice, right looking between these two columns, you would see a kind of grid pattern yes. going from the low column on top. That you see the column here, yes, yes. the beam across. Yes, yes. Then you see built up is the grid pattern to the higher column How that allow you to get light in at the side. And both, there were uh, roofs. There was the low roof and the high roof. 
And there's oh. some of the original colors. Oh, <laughs> yes. And you would see the original columns under that beam. And you should see some of the original color under this beam. At least a little piece there. There is it. See? Yeah. We're holding this. And then you see original color under that beam over there also at the high Tell roof. me something. Why do some columns end when scoop out like a flower and then some are straight up? Because some of the work wasn't finished. And this is the papyrus form column. You got to, because this is in the south. The column, the capitals of the column are made like a lotus flower. If you, when you go to the north, the capitals of the column are made like papyrus, unless they got what they call the mix uh -huh. ca a, a capital, where they integrate both papyrus and lotus or other design. And you know what's also astounding is how well laid out these columns are oh yes the, when you uh, when you if you went look at, that, of, look at that line there it's perfect yes but if you went in the center here you will notice that if you went in the center here you, you would notice again if you went in the center here you would notice a complete from oh. the end of the building to the other end of the building. Right down there. There's a straight tube. Perfectly aligned. Just as this one, it forms somewhat of a cross. Yes. You go straight down through the entire <sighs> temple. That would be west to east. Or you go down from north to south. The entire color of uh, temple. Amazing. Just amazing. This is about uh, six stories tall. Well, uh, 50 feet, feet, five feet for 10 feet. foot uh, uh, is a floor. From floor to floor is 10 feet, and that's one floor. Mm -hmm. You got 50 feet, that's five, five floors. Five floors. Five stories. Five stories. No mortar. No mortar. If you notice the Tell me, there's a good example of the car, the original column, the face there. There's no matter. The joints are perfectly as if they were sanded. When we were at the uh, Ram Museum, we were looking at the one of the bases. Yes. And there was a little hole. Uh, a key. And that's a key. A key. And that's, that was used to anchor. That was to anchor the stone. Just in the event of hurricane, uh, not a hurricane, uh, earthquake, that the temp if it didn't shake, it wouldn't move. It would act as if it was one solid piece. So you're looking at master engineers, engineers. master architect. Oh yes, master uh, craftsmen of, the, of their period, and uh, up to today they would be masters. And a magnificent. Uh, religion oh yes religious oh yes philosophy of these, peace these were the founders of religious theosophy used today by judaism christianity and islam they have not gone beyond it they're still using the fundamentals that were established along the nile and best expressed here in this temple yes in addition to the religious theology that was embodied here. There's just a sense of peace and tranquility that is absolutely overwhelming. This of a god for whom this magnificent temple was named. That is a relief of God Amun Re, holding an ankh in his left hand the ankh is the symbol of the key of life and in his right hand he has the highest symbol of office the was scepter in front of him is Ramesses the second the pharaoh giving him a gift of something to drink now these are awesome Obelisks, yes. 
Which is a Greek name, is it not? Yes, it means uh, a needle-like pyramid. In fact, you notice on the top, shapes like a pyramid. And that used to be col color by coated with silver and gold. Really? Yes, they call it electron. Are these two related in any way as far as religion is concerned? Or? Yes. That one is the column. The one the on obelisk. the right? Yes, the oblique of Makari Hatshepsut. Yes. And this is of her son-in-law, Thutmose's third. The same Hatshepsut queen who we saw, right? That's, uh, had, had a, she was Shirin at 1580 to 1450-something. Uh, Where was this granite brought from? Aswan, uh, uh, which is about four and a half hours drive from here, south. Four and a half hours drive? By, yes, by automobile. And there was no driving in those days? No, well... So they brought it up on barge? It came up on the Somehow boat. Somehow they got it out of the quarry. Out the quarry. Got it down to the river. Down to the river. Put it on a barge that was large. Now this is one piece. That's one right. solid one piece. One solid monolithic piece. How much does it weigh, would you say? Oh, I mean, a few thousand tons. What does the shape of the obelisk represent? It represents a tapered uh, penis. It, frankly, it goes back to the story of Isis, using the Greek name, Aset would be the Egyptian name, put in erecting a symbol of her husband penis because her husband, Asar, or otherwise called Osiris, was murdered by his brother, Set Typhon. It was also a set brother. That, that's that story we saw on the wall. Right. With and, the hippopotamus. Right. And when he was murdered and cut up into 14 pieces, she went and found find the pieces symbolically around the wall, but could not find one piece, the penis, because his brother had thrown the piece, that piece in the Nile, and the Nile catfish ate it. So she had them built or cut an obelisk to remind those who had persecuted and murdered him of his penis, so that whenever they go, they'll always have to see the penis. I see. You would notice that it's George Washington Memorial in Washington, D.C. is a copy of this. So what are you saying to me? That it's a symbol of his penis. Not George's, but... George, the President of the United States, the obelisk is symbolic of the penis regardless of who got one. It has one meaning. Now why? I wonder Be what George would say. Well, you know why? Every member of the United States, original Congress, and members of the cabinet of the United States, the first cabinet, was a Mason except one man, Benjamin Franklin, because he was a Quaker. What does and that have to do with what we're talking about? The, the, the symbols they use for setting up the United States was based upon the Masonic order of the, which they copied from here, the 22 tablets that were stolen from here by England. They used those tablets and used... Take for instance, and is the pyramid included in some, oh, I mean, oh yes. the obelisk? The pyramid and the money, like you said it. And the obelisk? The obelisk, the ever-seen eye, which they call the, the, the um, some funny name for it. The pyramid, the sunburst, is symbolic of God, amun Ra and Ra. Uh, this, Goddess uh, Ma'at of the Supreme Court building uh, with a scale, only that the scale with uh, Ma'at is level. The scale in the United States is up and down. Not just this, but ju just this. Not just this. Okay. And so on. Chamber here that we are in. What, what are these two figures here, Dr. Ben? Well, the figure on your left is Tutankhamun, and the figure on your right is his wife, the daughter of Akhenaten. She was the fifth daughter uh, of Akhenaten Natim uh, of Tutankhamun. How uh, can you tell this was King Tut? Well, in this case, because I happen to know the question uh, out of the statue, although 
there is the, no cartouche for me to follow at this particular point. But at one time there was a cartouche so on the body. So even though he was a teenager, he had a wife? Oh yes. He was married to, um, I cannot married him to his daughter before he mounted the throne. Uh, bef uh, just a quick word about features. Full lips, apparently wide nose. It was. Is this nose. an art? It was this an artistic concept, or is this an approximation of how the man looked? Uh, the uh, the artist must have been running through this country, because <laughs> that that concept is going on a lot of statues. Okay, okay. Now what's this? Uh, this I see that the holy of holies. Goes up, you so notice it that must it, be the floor start to ramp up, and as soon as the floor start to ramp up, you start to question yourself. I am going to the Holy of Holies. This and is a place that you don't believe in going into. I do not go into Holies. I put, pay the reverence as I would not go into a modern synagogue, a modern church, a modern mosque in the Holy of Holies. I show it the respect. You wouldn't walk on the altar of certain churches. No, sir. This is the no, sir. Uh, I don't have to pray like the people who it belong to, but I show them the respect. What is this? This is based upon a calendar. The, the ancient Egyptians, how they were able to put numbers. Two, one, three. two, three. Three. 10, 20, four. 21, 22, 23, 24. 24. 24 again, 33. Three. 32. I see. 100. 210, 20, 30, 230, 220. Now, how was this used? Well, it was used to add. Like a calculator? Oh, yes. This was used as a calculator. And it was generally based upon months or summon. Uh, they did the addition. They had to, to deal with how much grain, how much tons of this and tons of that. And that was the mathematical uh, way of doing numbers. Interesting. Mm -hmm. How long did it take you to put all of this together? <laughs> In my head? I guess a few years. A they, few years? Yeah, you don't. A few you, decades. You don't know when you're getting it, when it's coming into you. Well, what do you say to somebody who's looking at this program that we're doing? and their head begins to swim. What do you say to them about how they can hope to deal with this? My advice would be, don't get perturbed. It's a process of education and it takes time. It took if you time get, to build and it took time to understand. It took more time to build it than it, <laughs> than it takes so. time to understand it. Now we are going to the Temple of Tutmosis the third. Yeah. Aho. What? The, the, the painter of Jesus. Oh. And Joseph and Mary. The Christians use this temple. This faded figure here is yes. supposed to be of Jesus. Of with Jesus the... with the wrong thing around his head, I think. So this was co opted by. This was made a Christian temple. Make a, look at the other, t look at the other, and you're going to see more. Here, here. You see it? There. Yes, I see it. That's the statue of God, the triad of the temple. God, Amun, Amun Re, his son, Konsu, God Konsu, his wife, Goddess, Note the holy triad which the Christians copied and called the Trinity. You look at the top of the column, see some are still, still yeah. color, and you see Jesus, Joseph, and Mary, and you see where they copied it from. They cut that up to make it look like a crucifix. The early Christians. Not only did they. How do you know this? Well, because. We have the evidence of, of the paintings there. I see. We have the evidence of uh, the cutting of the thing by here is the um, point itself. These were statues, as you see, 
They didn't even finish because they didn't finish cutting off the neck and head of the one to the right. And we have the experience of all the other temples that they occupied. Uh -huh. Since Dr. Ben has been coming here for the last 50 years, sometimes as many as six times a year, just about everybody knows him. Dr. Ben, brother. Hi, brother. How are you, brother? My brother. How are you? How are you? I've seen you. And how are you? Good. Hello, how are you? Hello, Come on. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Good morning. Welcome. Oh, I see you again. Welcome to Upper Egypt. Hello, sure. Good to see you over here. Hey. Who was this lake built for? For the priests. And who built it? Under what reign? Uh, the or dynasty. Oh, this this lake was built during the 18th dynasty by under the reign of uh, Amenhotep the third. And what is the purpose of this lake? So that the priests could clean themselves. The priests in every ritual have to take a bath. He, anything that he does in the temple, and anytime he enter the temple, he must wash himself before going. Anytime he eat, he must wash himself before putting in food in a dirty body. Was there such a thing as a priestess? Yes, but they didn't come here. They had their own uh, temples, and they did not deal with these worship temples. Now, on the left here, I see some steps over on the left side of this uh, lake. Yes, that's so that's that, where they step down so to do the their bathing. Could come down and go, go up. Yes. Let's ride north to see two temples. En route, there was some time to sort out and digest all that this man, Dr. Ben, had shown us. It took almost two hours to reach our first site, the temple at Abydos. But they, they, look, I know she had to fall. I know it will happen. Yes. Thank you. Hello. 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 Forty-two steps. Yeah. Yeah. You could come. Forty-two risers. Too. This was built originally by Pharaoh Seti I. It was extended by his son, Ramesses II. What you are seeing here, this section was built by Ramesses II. And then... There's that name again. <laughs> everywhere. You're going to see him ev everywhere. There is uh, Ramesses showing you his father also and himself and the god Osiris. This was just a place of worship for him. It was more than that because when we go outside in the back and up to the rear, it is where Osiris is supposed to have been buried. Oh really? The god of resurrection. It is here that the was... The one who was cut up in pieces. Yes. We're the back of the temple of Set I one. All right. And sitting on the exit and egress, the egress and ingress temple of Osiris. All right. Now, what happened to Osiris? And when you say egress, that means go out. Yes. That means he went out through this tunnel here. Right. What happened that led him to go out through that tunnel? He was murdered for the second time and completed his stay in the world, as you know it, and went to the netherworld. Well, let me take you back a, a bit. For those who may be confused when you say he was murdered a second time, what was the first murder? He was hanged by his brother. Yes. His wife, goddess, I said appeal to God Ra. The God Ra gave him the power to bring him back. She and the god of death, Ampu, otherwise called Anubis. 
He came back and the brother heard that he was back again. The brother came and killed him for the second time. This time cut him up into 14 pieces. As depicted on that wall. Right. All right. And he somehow, his, he, he survived that. Yes, his wife again with Ampu went, got him, reconstructed the body, but the one piece was missing, the spinach which had been thrown in the Nile River and eaten by the Nile catfish. All right. So with this missing member, what happened? She again went to God. God Ra. Ra resurrected, gave him back his penis, resurrected his penis, and allow him to make the virgin birth, immaculate conceived child, Horus, his son, Heru. With who? Out of who? With Aset, Isis. All right. Then he left and went back for good. Out of the, out the Through that tunnel, into the mountain, to the next world, where he will remain and judge. How far does this passageway lead? Into the inner world, into the inner hills, into the inner mountain. No one knows where the end is. Nobody knows, huh? No one knows. Nobody have been there. Haven't People they? have tried to go, but they have not been successful in reaching the end of it. Many people have gone in there, but turned back. They keep going and going and went too far. It's tough going. I can see that because you got mountains out there. All right. It is believed that it is somewhere in the middle of the mountain. I know. I don't know. I've been in about 20 feet and give up. I didn't plan to go in more than that anyhow. Wow. Is it as close as uh, inside the pyramid? It, the feelings make you feel. Because you understand <laughs> that it's supposed to lead you to nowhere that you're going to find an end, psychologically, uh, in my case at least, you, you give up because you realize it's getting dark and dark, but it's providing an electric light in there. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take your word for it, and I'm not going to go down. I'll okay. just take your word for it, okay? I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> me too. In other words, you're coward like me. <laughs> but for our last temple site. This is the temple. They worship temple at them. Of goddess Het Heru, or goddess Hathor, at Dendera. Who built this temple and when? This temple was built by the Africans quite a long time ago, however. On the foundation of the existing temple, the Greeks came and added a portion of a temple, and then the Romans came and finished it. Oh. It was dedicated to goddess Het Heru, otherwise called Hathor. Uh, uh, what dynasty originally built this? Oh, this is, this was started in the 25th dynasty, however, it was completed and made a total in the 30th and 31st dynasty, the last. Oh, so this is towards the end. This, this is the end. Uh-huh. On the top of the, of the column, where the beam is sitting on, yeah. you see, that's best. Who is, uh, who's depicted at the top there? On the top, uh, relief, starting from left to right is Cleopatra, Caesarian, goddess Hathor, and the next. king, and, and Horus. I see. And on the next level down? On the left level down again, the same. That's the same thing. Well, wait a minute. Isn't that Hathor seated in the middle there? Yes, but she's seated on the top with a different crown. And the, and the second level is Isis. Look at the throne. I see. Well, you've got me faked out. And I notice all the faces on these huge, immense... Is Hathor. That is Hathor. It, it is a possible one that you could have seen the face there. Possibly. Just for the benefit of the camera, when, he, when the camera pans down, I just want viewers to see the enormity of these pillars. Oh, yes. Sometimes when these things are shown on video, without the human form to give you a sense of perspective, you don't realize how huge this is. You're 50 foot. This is 50 feet. Lord have mercy. Of all the pharaohs, queens, gods, and goddesses we heard about, some names stood out. Everywhere you go, you're going to see something about Ramesses. 
Uh, to me, Ramesses II was the greatest king in terms of action. Uh, he was a 19th dynasty king. He ruled for about 67 years. He lived till he was about 97, 98 years wow. old. Had a number of wives and uh, children. I wouldn't attempt like many to number them because I haven't, I'm not satisfied of any number that was left us. But Ramesses, because of the length of time and his activity as an engineer and so forth, an active man, he had more statues, more temples, more anything that he did, some of which people blame him or put in his name on other people's uh, artifacts or whatever. And so you're going to see him everywhere. I was surprised. But that seems to be the practice. I mean, as you took us up and down the Nile with these, and looked at these temples, we began to see that there were almost every temple uh, was improved or enlarged or expanded on by succeeding uh, dynast dynasties that followed. Yes, almost every temple had a previous, the one that you see had a previous temple there upon which foundation it sits. And many times the old temple walls are still way beyond, it was much larger than the temple that you were in at that particular time. And since Ramesses lived longer, it was only he had more time. He had more time to cover more ground. <laughs> so and he put his personality on everything up and down the Nile. And so why waste uh, uh, material to build a new wall when he could use the existing one? There are a couple other pharaohs that um, that's, we hear mentioned quite often. This, this pharaoh Akhenaten. Oh. Uh, though Akhenaten lived one mini faction of the time that Ramesses did, his impact on society, his impact on Judaism, Christianity, Islam. For example, this one man changed the religion or the worship, I prefer the term worship than religion per se, of the entire nation of Egypt. He moved, he left no doubt that the ancients believed in a common deity, a god. He changed it from the worship of the great god, Amun Re Ora, and with subordinate gods with different names, to the worship of one deity alone by the name of Aten, A T E N, using the same symbol, the disk of the sun, but adding thumbs, and elongated thumbs to it. Thus, the beginning of monotheism. Long, he died before Moses was born and preached monotheism. The same Akhenaten preached nonviolence. Long before the world went around today talking about nonviolence, he had spoken about it and lived it. He brought his cousin Simon Kare to do the administrative work of the government as a, they had two kings, while he concentrate on peace with other neighboring state. He, to prove it, he decommissioned most of his officers, reduced the size of the Egyptian armed forces to the point where Egypt was almost defenseless against its enemies. He weakened the Egypt. This man of the arts and everything like that was the name Aminotep the Fort. Otherwise, he changed his name from Aminotep to Akhenaten. Hatshepsut built her tomb. That's one of the objections they have with her. She got in trouble in the Valley of the Kings. Which she is right over there. Yes, but she was a queen who declared herself equally pharaoh, queen pharaoh and thought she had the right to bury in the Valley of the King because she served in the career of a king and that she was born not of ordinary man, that she was born of an immaculate conception and virgin birth to God Amun and Goddess Hathor. So that was a controversial position to take. Yes, but uh, showing you that there was a concept of the virgin birth and immaculate conception long before Mary and mm -hmm. Jesus and uh, so forth. That, that virgin birth thing is nothing new.
Then it was back to Cairo. In nearby Giza, literally a stone's throw away from those three awesome pyramids, stands the world-renowned Great Sphinx. The Sphinx is supposedly the statue of the second, the, the uh, person who is buried in the second period, Kafra. But that is just one view. It is, however, a remaining part of the quarry that gave to the pyramids the stones that you saw cut oh, there. Oh, it's the leftovers. The leftover. And out of that, the Sphinx has cut. It is the head of a pharaoh, or that pharaoh, the body of a lion. Dr. Ben has often said that when Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt, and came upon the Sphinx, he ordered that its head be blown off. Twenty-one rounds of cannon fire hit the Sphinx, defacing it. This, it's been said, is the origin of the 21-gun salute. There are many views on why Napoleon found the head of the Sphinx offensive. What do you think? Actually, the Sphinx is part of a complex of sites here, all having to do with the burial of the Pharaoh. Alongside the Sphinx, you can see a temple, it's called a valley temple. There it is coming up on the lower left. This is where the funeral rites began. Inside that temple, Dr. Ben showed us columns which he said were made of the same granite once encasing the pyramids. But and then, this is what the whole face of all three pyramids was like. This is all this, but at the bottom. But to me, the, the feat is this. You fly from here to Aswan at least one hour, generally one hour and 15 minutes. Figure that they're coming down by river, no motor, to bring all this material here. They have to quarry it in Aswan and then bring it here. And they didn't finish there. They bring it, put it in place and finish it. People think that they do all the carving and everything at a place and bring it up, put it up. No, they put up the stone and did the coffin after that. The Pharaoh die, okay? He dies. They have to take him and wash him and do the rituals. Then the opening of the mouth ceremony, right? But they don't perform the rest of the performance. They must ritualize him in the valley temple. The body of the pharaoh was taken up this causeway to the mortuary temple, where the mummification took place. Vital organs were removed and placed in special jars. So was the blood. A tedious process would preserve the corpse indefinitely, if undisturbed. Then the pharaoh's mummy, with the jars and valuables, was interred deep inside the pyramid. How does one digest all the dimensions of this 4,000-year civilization that Dr. Ben has outlined for us? The answer is simple, you can't. That would require the kind of long study that Dr. Ben himself is engaged in. But there are some basic understandings for us all that can be useful to us in these times, as you will see and hear in our next and last edition. Visit over a dozen sites. You fly from here to Aswan at least one hour, generally one hour and 15 minutes. Figure that they're coming down by river, no motor, to bring all this material here. They have to quarry it in Aswan and then bring it here. And they didn't finish there. They bring it, put it in place and finish it. People think that they do all the carving and everything at a place and bring it up, put it up. No, they put up the stone and did the coffin after that. The pharaoh die, okay? He dies. They have to take him and wash him and do the rituals. Then the opening of the mouth ceremony, right? But they don't perform the rest of the performance. They must ritualize him in the valley temple. The body of the pharaoh was taken up this causeway to the mortuary temple, where the mummification took place. Vital organs were removed and placed in special jars. So was the blood. A tedious process would preserve the corpse indefinitely, if undisturbed. 
Then the pharaoh's mummy, with the jars and valuables, was interred deep inside the pyramid. How does one digest all the dimensions of this 4,000-year civilization that Dr. Ben has outlined for us? The answer is simple, you can't. That would require the kind of long study that Dr. Ben himself is engaged in. But there are some basic understandings for us all that can be useful to us in these times, as you will see and hear in our next and last edition. Visit over a dozen sites However, this three-and-a-half-hour documentary on a 4,000-year civilization can at best be an overview, even with the guidance of Dr. Ben. Dr. Ben himself has devoted decades studying here and continues to do so. The perspective that Dr. Ben has given to the story has often sponsored controversy, for which he has paid a heavy price. I asked him if he thought it was worth it. Yeah, I'll do it again. Uh, I'll do it again because what it has here, what it is saying to the world, it, it, it relieved people from a religious bondage, religious slavery. If people knew what was here, they could see all the lies being told to them. It, they will see the, the, the reality and truth about religion. They see the love that the ancient did when they started this. They will see that, for instance, the Virgin Mary concept of, of, of immaculate concept is nothing new. Uh, and they were dealing with a human condition and the whole thing based upon a God, especially a Unitarian God. One God came from here, not from Rome, not from England, London, not from Hel Greece, Athens. It came from here, whether you're Jewish, Christian, Muslim or what. You've got the basis of what your religion is here, along is the Nile. Is this place in the Nile Valley, is this the seat of the world's first major civilization? Oh, yes. Egypt is the mother of war, the Western world civilization. It didn't start here. It started where Hinoffa said at the beginning of the Nile, but it reached its zenith here. The whole world must look to Egypt. The entire world, bar not a single country, every high culture must come here for the beginning of what they are. I don't care if it's Jewish, if you're Christian, or you're Muslim, if you're Greek, or you're Roman, you must come here. The marvelous structures along the Nile provide much more than an awesome display of size and beauty. These are the documents of and by the people who built them. You'll note that no edifice is bare. The writings and artistic renderings tell of the pharaohs and queens who are identified by nameplates called cartouches. The pharaoh was a representative of God for the people. The people contact with their God was through the pharaoh. A bad pharaoh, God looked upon the people are being responsible for him. Well, how did one become a pharaoh? From birthright or from revolution. Overthrowing the current pharaoh, or you gain it by birthright, or you are a commoner and you marry the daughter of a pharaoh who has legal right. So in other words, you inherited from the woman. Where did the pharaoh live? in regards in relationship to the people he lived at the palace and the palace was generally connected to the worship temple or to the burial temple or the or the pyramid so the the palace was actually not a palace as we think of it but it was part of the temple area part of the complex i see did the people have access to their pharaoh oh yes or was he aloof and apart oh, no, no, from no, no, them no. the access to the pharaoh however they had the access to a number of uh, 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 transition uh, from one secretary or one office to the next to the prime minister and they could see the pharaoh. There were many pharaohs who, had, who held people court, had certain days when the people were allowed to come to talk to the pharaoh. Was the pharaoh omnipotent or did he have advisors? The pharaoh had advisors and the most important advisor was the chief priest. Like this Imhotep you mentioned. Uh, Imhotep was not the chief priest, he was uh, like the Manetho. I see. Manetho. 
uh, the chief, the, especially when it came to war or anything that could involve disaster, the pharaoh listened to his chief priest because remember, the chief priest had the ears of God, the direct connection, the intercessory between man and his deity was the chief priest. The next is the uh, preparation of the coronation scene with the uh, putting of the crown and the pharaoh's head. And here you have the god Nith and goddess putting, the gods, goddesses, Nith and another one, putting the, the crown on the king's head. Pharaohs like the mighty Ramesses had their own temples built and made additions to others, adorning them with their likeness, but the temples were always in honor of a god or goddess. These deities were identified by headdress or by having the head or body of a symbolic creature. This hasn't been defaced as badly. No. All right, and so we can now see the difference between the right. two sisters. Right. The one to the right is Neptis, and the other one in the front to the left is Isis. Then the the one on the right is which one now? One on the right is her sister, Neptis. Neptis. And what is that on top of this? The, the or a maze. This? It's called a maze. All right. And the one on the left is Isis? Isis with a throne on her head. That's a throne. Now, there she is with her husband. Okay. Now. There she is with her husband, Osiris. And he's in what is called the Osirian position. Two foot together. Uh-oh. Hands crossed. Dead. As an S, he's dead. In it. That's called the Osirian position. Anytime you see Osiris standing, he's going to be that way because he's a god of the dead, god of the deceased, god of resurrection. So whenever you see a figure with their feet together and they're holding these, the, the crop and what is the other one? Uh, the crook. The, the crook? crook and the flail. The flail. It will be, I, he's never shown all the way when he's standing houses ancient miniature wood carvings depicting the everyday lives of the common folk. When conducting his tours, Dr. Ben always employs local guides to work with him. Farouk has been with Dr. Ben since 1980, working in the Aswan area. Did you see many uh, uh, tour groups uh, with uh, people of African descent before Dr. Ben? No. I have seen, I only was, I may, so it was like uh, two, three in a group, but not like what, since Dr. Ben started, we saw the African Americans in Egypt, and that was exactly the time, and when was the, where the, exactly was also the Askak, was the biggest group in ever, in 87. So the people in Egypt, no one, they, we, everyone, just they don't know about the African Americans until Dr. Burns started his groups in Egypt. Ah. The majority, I mean, the common people in the country, in the village, they don't know anything about until they, Dr. Burns started his uh, groups to Egypt here and his tours to Egypt. Does he teach a different perspective of uh, the Nile civilization? Well, than the usual well yes what he is uh, it's a kind of what we all the egyptologists study it all the what is the books and what it's published and written from the 18th century from the since that time so there is a same one track and i say now when is the dr benz and his other the professors they started to open a new way of, I mean, study, or, uh, so this is, is, is uh, the, is something different than what it's written, one, what the archaeologists or the tour guides studied in uh, their own way. So You mean but, one is a European perspective and Dr. Ben is an African perspective? Exactly, yes. Yeah. A lot of people say that uh, all of this was not built by by uh, by people of color. That this was all built by by whites. Dr. Ben seems to be saying something different. Well, it's who is the I mean, what is the meaning by white is or the color? It's we are in Africa, 
So Egypt is Africa. Shawkey works with Dr. Ben in the Luxor area. How long has this gentleman been working with you? How long? Years. I am a guide 14, but I worked with Dr. Ben 12 years. 12 years? 12 years. How did you meet him? Uh, I saw him in, uh, in, in the monument, in the Valley of the Kings, once a, once a year. And I listened to him when he talked to his people. And uh, I sit with him, I visit him, and I like his way, what he's doing with his people. And uh, I am a Nubian, part of Nubian, you know. So I, I see. Am a, I am a Nubian Egyptian African. What is it that you liked about what he says to say? Uh, yes, because I like history. I love. I am interesting. So he big official, he big professor, and uh, mention about ancient history, about Nubian history, life in Egypt. He emphasizes the Nubian. Nubian. So I love Nubian people. And I wish to be new good forever. <laughs> you will be. Yes. By the way, many years ago, a humble Egyptian village along the Nile named Daboud offered what little food and drink they had to Dr. Ben and his tour group that had become stranded because their bus broke down. Ever since then, Daboud has been part of Dr. Ben's tour. He always doubles whatever his tour group donates to Daboud. There is, in fact, an ongoing tug of war on the question, what did the ancient Egyptians look like? What color were they? Western culture has been more than a little fuzzy about this. In school, most of us learned about the pharaohs and the sphinx, but not much about who built them. And with the face of the sphinx blown almost away, it really wasn't clear, although I must admit that as a kid, I personally always wondered about that sphinx's head. New York Studios with Dr. Ben. You know, Dr. Ben, um, you mentioned uh, in an interview we did uh, uh, along the Nile that uh, your father told you when you were a younger man that you needed to go to Egypt to see for yourself about your history. Uh, when you made that trip and you came back and saw your father, what did you say to him and what did he say to you? First of all, uh, what I said to my father was I asked him a general apology for the way I had treated him in, with, with respect to what he was saying prior to my going there. You were disbelieving. Yes. You see, I, I grew up in Puerto Rico and the, and the United States Virgin Islands, primarily St. Croix and Puerto Rico, my mother being a Puerto Rican. Uh, a, a young girl that came to St. Croix. And what my father was saying to me as against what I was learning in the school was a contradiction. And I tend to go towards the, the school, the synagogue, and so forth. I had, a, I had a little contradiction in my upbringing. I was going to the Catholic school because uh, as a private school for the first time. And then I went to the public school. After I was acceptable, I was uh, not born the, uh, there. And so I had to apologize to my father because I thought that Greece and Rome was it. And Judaism was the things. These three things was the most magnificent thing could happen to me. So what did he say when you apologized to him? He, he said to me, I knew what the result would be when you return. Did he make a prediction about what you were facing in the years ahead? Yes, my father knew that I was prone to engineering, had studied in engineering. He knew that I owe him an obligation to study law. Uh, he knew some of my outlook from speaking with him in general. But did he make any predictions? Yes, he let me know. If you go through law engineering or so, you can be comfortable in an economic sense. If you go to the direction that you're thinking on now, using this to make people understand, to bring your people such as an African. Uh, I had been influenced by Garvey and, and, and Alviso Campo. These were the, my two heroes, Marcos Garvey and Don Alviso Campo. He said, you're going to pay a serious price. You may even wind up in jail. You may even get killed. Because if you challenge the system with the new knowledge that you have, you can pay a big price. All right, now speaking about knowledge, um, 
you mentioned uh, that the Ten Commandments, when we were in Egypt, you mentioned that the Ten Commandments that we are aware of are derived from 42 commandments that carry another name, the negative confessions. Or admonitions to Goddess Ma'at. I see. And they, they're thousands of years older than the so-called Ten Commandments, you see. No, we, we have some visuals that are on the uh, that you took on the wall. Let's let's there it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, those are the negative confessions. Those are, those are the for, uh, some of the forty-two negative confessions. Now, w when you say negative confessions, that means because they start in negative. Hail Maat, I have not killed man or woman. Hail Maat, I have not made light thy bushel. Hail Maat, I have not spoken ill of the God. So these are. These the, would be the English version. I have of it. not, as yes. opposed to thou shalt thou shall not. not. It means that the order was issued already. Thou shalt not. This is the response. All right. Now we've moved a little, a little fast here, uh, because now we're looking at a slide of the judgment. The judgment that someone seat. has passed on. Right. No. From left, my left hand side, and your left, going right. There is Annie. That figure right there. On the left. On the left. Extreme left. And Annie is coming towards the judgment scene. That is the scale there. And the, right be between Annie and the next figure, there's a heart you see there. That is symbolically the heart of the person. In other words, the kneeling figure stands, sit, squats between the person's heart and a feather. The heart is in front of him to the left. Uh -huh. Behind him is the feather in a scale, an ostrich feather. The heart has to balance the, with the uh, feather to prove that the man is speaking the truth. Now, the, the person, the figure there is the god of the dead, Anubis or Anubis. Ampu. Behind him with the uh, 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 bird's head. Falcon's head. It, no, no, that's, that's, that's a... Uh, um, God of the scribes, is that? Yes, yeah, right. Tahuti. Mm -hmm. It is um, not a falcon uh, at this moment. Ibis. I, Ibis. Ibis said. That is um, Tahuti. That's the god of writing, symbolically. He is taking down the record of what? And the top are the judges. You have, isn't it? Look at what happened. You got 14 judges, 12 regular, and 2 alternate. They, what the United States has copied. I see. All right. Dr. Ben, uh, we do need to take a break. Uh, and we'll come back for our very last segment. Uh, please stay with us. Uh, this business about color, I raised it in one of the segments in this program. Is it important to, to uh, worry about uh, and argue about this issue of color and what color the Egyptians were? Egyptians had no special color. They were Africans, light skin, dark skin, black, uh, brown. Uh, You've got to understand that at the time of the early Egyptians, there were no Greeks yet, and there were no Romans. The Greeks and the Romans did not come until about uh, uh, 1000 BC. Uh, the Hebrews did not come in until the Egyptians were already in the th uh, 13th dynastic period. It was strictly an African culture. So then, are we wrong in raising that issue now about color, and um, are you arguing against yourself, actually, when you say that uh, uh, color is an issue? Uh, color is an issue because it was made a, an issue by Western uh, uh, academicians and by the movies and others by showing uh, this and making statements that the Africans had no play. In other words, you'd never raise the argument if somebody didn't say otherwise. Oh, sure. And I would not have even gone to, to, to Egypt hadn't the question been raised as to the Egyptians and myself having no part in this. Uh -huh. All right. Now, Daboud, this village... Uh, this village that uh, gave you, f your, you and your tour group many, many years ago uh, food and refreshments because you were stuck on the roadside in hot weather, I assume. Uh, what is your relationship with Dibut? You've adopted the village in a sense? Yes, sir. Uh, when, well, oh, we were passing and one of our buses broke down. Uh, Dr. Lewis was on that trip with his little daughter and his wife, uh, 18 months old. We needed food. We didn't have none. We were going to be there for three uh, 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 hours. These people befriended us. The very little that they had had had, had nothing. They befriended us, share everything with us, and from that day on, I adopted that village. 
And in, in adopting them, you always bring your tour groups there and whatever contributions? The tour group must stop there. It's always in my program. And whatever the group contribute, I double it. If the group give $10, I give 20 If they give 2000 I give 4000 You're quite something, Dr. Ben. Thank you. Like it has undertook this documentary for a number of reasons. Number one is to emphasize what should be obvious, that the unparalleled civilizations of ancient Egypt were of and by Africans. Also, it seems only right that all should see the evidence of what Africans had once achieved, perhaps providing some inspiration to today's viewers, especially those of African descent. What you don't know can hurt you. Dr. Ben was our choice because he is a long-distance runner in telling the story of Africa's Egypt. Finally, it is hoped that this series will play some small role in reconnecting African Americans with our ancestral home, much in the same joyous spirit of the mutual embrace between members of Dr. Ben's tour group and the people of the Egyptian village Dr. Ben has adopted called Dabu. For a transcript of this program, send $4 to Journal Graphics, 1535 Grant Street, Denver, Colorado, 80203. To place a credit card order, call 1-800-TALK-SHOW. over the ages. The